So uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, CSIS. My name is Carl Meacham, and I am the director here uh, of the Americas program. I'm glad you could join us this morning. Uh, and as you all know, today's event is a special one. It is a statesman's uh, forum. Uh, we've had great speakers in the past, and I, I believe that today is going to be uh, is going to be equally as impressive as we've. Uh, uh, done in the past. So I'm honored to welcome our guest today is Panamanian Foreign Minister Francisco Alvarez de Soto for a discussion uh, of his country's growing role in the Western Hemisphere as an economic and diplomatic leader. Uh, I'll leave it to our guest uh, to talk about Panama's emergence as a regional leader, uh, which has been particularly noticeable uh, in the past several months uh, and weeks. Uh, but before we get started, I'd like to give you a brief uh, view of where Panama is now and what we might be able to expect from it in the near future. Panama is among the fastest growing countries in the hemisphere. It registered uh, GDP growth over, of over 5% in 2013 and is expected to grow as much, if not more, in the next few years. Panama enjoys among the lowest inflation and unemployment rates in the region. And the recent discovery of oil reserves provides yet another indicator of its bright future. The long-awaited completion of the Panama Canal expansions will only boost its competitiveness, serving as a boon not only to Panama's economy, but also to regional commerce writ large. Much of the attention Panama has garnered in recent months, though, has not focused on hemispheric commerce. Instead, attention on Panama has centered on the increasingly vocal role it's played in the defense of democracy in the wake of the protests that have racked Venezuela since early February. Uh, the Panamanian government has repeatedly expressed its concerns with the crisis, and Panama was among one of just three countries in the hemisphere uh, to call for action at the OAS uh, to respond to events in Venezuela. Panamanian ambassador to the OAS, Arturo Vallerino, even ceded his floor time uh, to a leading member of the Venezuelan opposition, providing her with a forum to present her perspective of the crisis to the other ambassadors. Uh, in light of Panama's vocal role in the international community's response to the crisis, uh, the Venezuelan government responded with breaking diplomatic and economic relations with Panama. I was mentioning uh, to the foreign minister uh, all the compliments that I've heard about his speech yesterday at the OAS, uh, which he said what had to be said, but he said it in such a way uh, that I believe uh, didn't uh, make folks that were... Uh, so passionately on, uh, supportive of one side or the other, uh, not listen to what he had to say. And I think that that's a real talent, particularly with an issue as, uh, as hot as Venezuela. So uh, you get a sense of, of, of his expertise and, and, and how good he is uh, at what he does. So in light of Panama's already pivotal role in regional commerce, uh, its, reg its recent uh, emergence as a leader in hemispheric politics uh, to, uh, will be addressed uh, in today's event, and it's particularly timely. Uh, I'm, uh, thankfully, we have some truly well positioned, uh, someone truly well positioned to comment on Panama's success and perhaps some of the challenges it may face as it continues to define its path as an influential hemispheric leader. Francisco Alvarez de Soto has been Panama's foreign minister since February of this year. He has an extensive uh, experience both in the public and private sectors, uh, serving previously as a partner and director of law uh, at the consulting firm Alves & Company. Uh, he also served as deputy minister, acting minister of foreign affairs, deputy minister of international trade negotiations, and executive director of legal and regulatory affairs at Cable and Wireless Panama. Uh, which is the largest tele telecommunications company in Central America. With all that said, uh, you know, we're really lucky to have you uh, and, and, and very happy that we'll be able to address uh, the timely events that I uh, mentioned. Um, I want to remind all of you and those who are watching uh, that this event is on the record. Uh, the usual rules apply this morning. We uh, will have a question and answer period after uh, the foreign minister gives his brief remarks. When posing your questions, please identify yourselves um, and try to uh, ask a question, not just have a statement. Um, so um, 
I'd like to welcome all of you. And once again, uh, uh, Mr. Foreign Minister, it's a pleasure to have you. The floor is yours. Sure. Great. About 15 minutes. Yeah. Is it on? All right. Great. It's on now? Can yeah. you hear me? OK. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I've just been told I have 15 minutes. <laughs> So um, I'll try to um, just stay focused on the main ideas I wanted to share with you this morning, which are around um, what I like to call the political economy of Panama's foreign policy. Um, in, in discussing that, in reflecting about that, uh, I would just like to start by um, sharing with you perhaps two basic principles uh, of our foreign policy, particularly in this administration. Um, one is that our diplomacy uh, from day one, President Martinelli made it very clear, um, was economic and commercial mainly. Not because there is no need for political action in foreign policy, but because this administration has understood from day one that uh, our political um, agenda internationally had to be um, based and much influenced by our economic and trade agenda. Why? Because we are a trading nation. We are a nation in change. We wanted to make Panama a different country in these five years, uh, taking a lot of the historical values that we have as a nation, uh, you know, dating back to colonial times when Charles V first thought about uh, you know, this pathway from the Atlantic to the Pacific, um, back to the railway in the 19th century, and so on. Uh, we are a trading nation, and uh, as, a na as a small nation in the Isthmus uh, of Central America, to grow, we need to look outside of our borders. Uh, there is no way Panama could be able to grow the way it's been doing it, particularly in the, the, these five years, uh, if, it, if it was not because of how much we believe in free trade and how much we believe in a free um, economy. Of course, for that, you need to have a strong democratic system, um, a democracy that continues to improve itself uh, by perfecting the human rights of all its citizens, by perfecting the right of people to descend, by perfecting the participation of every single citizen in the political life of the country. Uh, now, you know, we are in the middle of a uh, electoral process to elect our next president. Uh, the entire National Assembly, mayors of cities uh, and towns uh, and council people, these uh, coming um, 4th of May. And I like to say, and this is something I've been uh, sharing with a few people that I have met uh, yesterday here, like Senat Senator Rubio, uh, for us is an electoral party. We celebrate uh, in political tournament. Of course, with the heated debates, with the, the Latino kind of way of uh, doing politics. Um, but in the end, is it's a show of tolerance. It's a show of how much Panama has improved uh, since the, the dark days of uh, you know, the uh, regime that was headed by uh, now in prison General Noriega. Uh, the country has done a tremendous transformation of which uh, we all uh, Panamanians are very proud of. So uh, with that in mind, uh, as you know, it, was, it was pointed out, we have done in these five years a lot to make sure that Panama is ready to assume a new role. And this is something we've been saying um, since 2009. Panama, we wanted Panama to get closer to what we called first world. For that, we tried to figure out what was it that we had to do. Uh, not only uh, being very aggressive the way we've been, I, I believe, in international trade integration, um, this administration has accomplished, uh, in terms of trade negotiations, far more than any other administration. Um, and I could list it for you very quickly. Um, 
things that uh, finishing up a very important trade agreement with Canada that was left hanging, uh, being able to convince the United States in a way to um, launch and complete the implementation of the, the uh, free trade agreement with the United States, the only bilateral, by the way, tra trade agreement in Central America, because the rest of the region completed a, a regional um, free trade agreement with the United States. We managed diplomatically to convince the European Union and the Central American countries that Panama was worth including in the negotiations of the trade agreement between Central America and the European Union. Panama was completely out. Uh, Panama was uh, a country that both parties, Central America and the European Union, demanded that in order for it to be able to sit at the negotiation table, it had to join the Central American common market. Uh, and, and that was actually agreed upon by the previous administration. The problem was that it did not deliver on the political promise to both parties. For me, in my experience in this administration, I think that was the, the most challenging trade diplomatic project that this administration accomplished um, because we had both parties against us. Uh, the European Union was very skeptical of Panama's attitude towards regional integration, had promised many, many times it would join, had promised many times many things regarding Central America, but it had never delivered. And of course, on the other, on the other side, we had the Central American countries also not believing. So um, Panama convinced everybody that it had to be the other way around. Panama's argument had been, look, we are, first of all, the European Union's number one trade partner, trade and investment partner. I don't know if you know this. I, I say this figure uh, repeatedly because it's, it's, for me it's impressive. Of all trade between the European Union and the entire Central American region, Panama buys 52, 53% of everything the region gets from the European Union. Of course, for the Panamanian market, uh, having the largest capacity to, to consume, but also for re-shipping um, and redistributing in the entire region. So it's Panamanian capital and Panamanian entrepreneurs that actually bring that sort of trade from the European Union onto Central America. So there you have the trade capacity, the financial capacity, and the logistics for it. So that was argument number one. And num argument number two was, look, in order for us to really figure out how we should go about the Central American market, we need to sit with the Central American partners and negotiate with the only partner in the world that demands a regional agreement. Uh, and it was ironic, we convinced the Europeans first and we convinced our own uh, partners on the table. It was the European Union that realized that the pie without Panama was half. So the European Union actually convinced the rest of Central America that we should be sitting next to them to improve the offer vis-a-vis uh, -vis the European Union. Uh, we did that, we accomplished that, we led the closing of those negotiations with the European Union. And based on those, on those results, Panama was able to map out how we should negotiate the joining of the Central American Common Market. And we did it also based on the free trade agreements, the bilateral free trade agreements we had with the rest of the region. Um, and we have delivered on our word. And that's one of the main results uh, I guess that we should be very proud of is that this administration in, f in, in many topics regarding foreign policy, we have delivered on what we had said. And this is one of the best examples. We promised we would join the negotiations, we promised we would close the negotiations, and we promised that upon that we would join the Central American Common Market. And guess what? Not only we joined it, now we're leading the Secretariat on, international, on Economic Integration in Central America. It's a Panamanian, very ironic, 
uh, that is leading the economic integration of Central America, Carmen Gisela Vergara, a former trade minister in the previous administration. So I keep telling my colleagues uh, in Central America, the foreign ministers and trade ministers, do not lecture Panama on regional integration anymore. Integration is, of course, uh, a very important aspect of our foreign policy. Uh, and that's, I guess, the, the most important action that we have accomplished uh, in order to promote and to project Panama abroad. But there are, have been other initiatives um, that we have accomplished in order to position Panama once again on the economic, trade, and political front. And, and this is the fact that Panama, for the very first time, has decided to be vocal on global issues. If you look at, for example, our activities uh, in the context of the United Nations, you could see that Panama, for the first time, has not only you know, voted in favor of, I guess, uh, resolutions uh, that are addressing complicated um, topics, but it has co-sponsored with leading nations in the world uh, resolutions that are daring. And I'm referring, for example, to how Panama is um, addressed topics like uh, North Korea uh, on human rights, how Panama has been very vocal on Syria. Panama has even suspended diplomatic relations with Syria, uh, given the fact, uh, given the situation on human rights in Syria. Uh, Panama has been uh, vocal and concerned about Ukraine, for example, and the situation in Crimea. And like in you know, any democracy, there are those um, locally that say, why is it the Panamanian government being vocal about Ukraine? It's, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a topic that should be of no, I guess, uh, particular direct interest to Panama. Wrong. Why are we worried about those kind of topics. In the case of Ukraine, for example, um, and the whole debate about what is going on with Crimea and now with the latest uh, uh, news that we are hearing about the, you know, the eastern part of uh, Ukraine and so on, uh, it's simple. Panama is worried because this situation is affecting um, the normal standing of its partners. Russia is a good partner of Panama, uh, and Russia is taking a stand that is basically making it to confront two very valuable partners for Panama, the European Union and the United States. If um, there is any sort of economic or trade instability, particularly uh, with the European Union, that's going to affect trade, international trade, and if its international trade is affected, Panama is affected. Not only because it's a valuable partner in the, in the Central American region, but because of the Panama Canal. There are projections of how much international maritime trade will grow. Partners around the world need to be stable economies, need to be focused governments on um, economic affairs, international economic affairs, situations like this distract people. Spending time in addressing complicated situations like this, which must be addressed, of course, um, distract economies from other topics. And that's where Panama needs to be vocal, and that's where Panama needs to be contributing uh, in the multilateral arena, which is where we believe we can do our best part. We've been vocal, of course, in other topics, um, as I said. And in the Americas, we've been particularly active. Uh, I mentioned Central America, and I'd like to mention other initiatives where we are very forthcoming. Um, one is in the Caribbean. Panama in this administration is, is played particular in interest uh, on the Caribbean, uh, wants to relaunch a very um, valuable organization not many people know about, which is the Association of Caribbean States. People tend to think of CARICOM when we talk about the Caribbean, but in reality, there is a larger um, 
a larger region, the Greater Caribbean. And the Association of Caribbean States is the best forum for the Greater Caribbean to try to understand uh, each other in that region better. Uh, we believe that it's particularly important in the case of SICA, in the case of Central America, in how to approach and engage with CARICOM. And in that sense, Panama, um, since it uh, led the Foreign Minister's Council of the Association uh, last year before it handed over the presidency to Mexico, made it very clear that we would stand for a transformation of the Association of Caribbean States from a mere forum where technical cooperation on very specific topics was discussed at very low political levels should be transformed and should become a political and economic forum for the greater Caribbean, where ministers uh, with political capacity could address, um, I guess, uh, in a clear manner, a challenge in the region, which is transport. Uh, we believe that uh, the Caribbean will not be able to grow and improve the economic standards if it's not capable of improving its transport routes. Uh, if you look at uh, statistics on these topics, you will realize that it's extremely, to me, ridiculous that it is more difficult to move around the Caribbean nations than to uh, move out of Caribbean nations onto the rest of the continent and the rest of the world. It does not make sense to me uh, that people tell me that there are two daily flights from Barbados to London, but there are no direct flights from Barbados to Panama. It does not make sense. So those are things that ministers, the political levels, the presidents, the heads of government need to address, and they need a forum for that. And that's where Panama believes that um, with countries like Mexico, that we recognize and we give a lot of credit for the political, um, I guess, investment on uh, addressing uh, this new um, forum for the Greater Caribbean. We would like to um, spend time and, and, and effort on, on changing that dynamic. The same thing stands for a very important organization for the Americas, and is the Organization of American States. I had the opportunity of addressing the Permanent Council yesterday. Um, and truly, of course, and we will, we will talk about this in a few minutes, uh, we, we address the, the, the situation in Venezuela. But in addressing the Permanent Council, Panama wanted to make very clear to the membership that we stand for the organization. We are the first ones to engage in a constructive criticism of the organization. We uh, would be the first ones to say it needs changes, drastic changes, to the way it handles you know, its administration, its finances, its agenda, um, political affairs around the Americas. But it is the forum for the hemisphere. Panama cannot uh, accept and will not accept anyone saying the OAS is dead, the OAS is now a second round organization, it does not represent the Americas. Um, those sort of uh, comments only destroy the Americas. The discussion must be a constructive one, a broader one, it cannot be uh, a destructive one, an isolationist one. Arguments saying that a particular sector of the Americas needs to look inwards. And then after looking inwards, that part of the Americas would just look outside, leaving the rest. In our opinion, um, to a certain extent, is not recognizing and not respecting those other member states that are not part of that region. To a sense is, uh, to an extension is a disrespect. Uh, that's why we tend to say this organization 
has the history, has the credentials, has the infrastructure, has the experience, good and bad, to be able to um, recreate itself and move forward and be capable of addressing the realities of the Americas, where everybody is included with all the differences of opinion, with all the different, uh, different governments, and uh, the differences in understanding how the Americas should engage the rest of the world. Um, and that's what we, we, we reviewed yesterday. We think that uh, multilateralism in the Americas has to go um, through the Organization of American States. Uh, and issues in the Americas have to be addressed at the OAS. They can be addressed in regional and sub-regional organizations, but there is no valid argument to say that just because a situation, a topic, a matter is addressed regionally, it's automatically excluded from being considered uh, at the OAS. Uh, you, could use the, you, could, you could actually go into the parallelism with the United Nations just because then a topic is discussed at the Organization of American States, then it cannot be looked at at the UN. It does not make sense. That's not how diplomacy works. Um, and that takes me to conclude to the situation in Venezuela. We have been vocal um, on Venezuela for several reasons. Uh, and let me make this very clear. This is not political opportunism like some people have said around. Panama feels very strongly about the situation in Venezuela for historical and cultural reasons. Panama and Venezuela have a common history. Um, we share the same historical leaders. And there is so much culture in common that we cannot just look the other way. Not only that, in, in a situation back in our history that just I mentioned previously, when there were, Panama was going through hard times, Venezuela was very vocal and very active in favor of Panama and the Panamanian people. It would be almost against history not to spend the time and the political will and effort to um, contribute respectfully uh, without getting involved in internal affairs of Venezuela to um, help in the establishment of a true and valid dialogue between all the parties involved uh, in Venezuela and, and in the Venezuela situation. Panama has been very clear and very vocal about um, how the, go the Venezuelan government has responded to our gestures. First of all, we do not accept in any way that we have been involved in internal affairs of Venezuela. I think it's very clear that when you refer to the charter of the OAS, of which we are members, and Venezuela is a member, we are acting according to international law, a common international law, an inter-American law, and therefore our suggestion to call on the, the foreign ministers meeting something that it has been done many times in the past, the same suggestion was made in the case of Panama many years ago, was not getting involved in internal affairs of Venezuela, much less it was not an attempt to promote any sort of instability against the government of Venezuela, which we have never challenged. Uh, we regret very much the reaction. Uh, we keep reminding everybody that it was the gov Venezuelan government that unilaterally broke diplomatic relations, that declared persona non grata all our diplomats in Caracas and gave them 48 hours to leave the country. Those are measures that we think are, were unnecessary, disproportionate, and unfriendly. We did not respond in a similar fashion, and we will not engage in that sort of activity. We've been accused of getting involved in Venezuelan affairs, internal affairs, but it's been Panama and the Panamanian government that had to very clearly um, confront comments 
express comments, clear comments on the part of the Venezuelan president about the Panamanian electoral process and about his preferences towards a candidate in the Panamanian electoral process. That is getting involved in internal affairs of a sovereign state, clear and simple. To date, we have not heard any sort of uh, correction uh, to those sort of statements that were made not one time, but repeatedly. Panama will continue to be vocal about this. Panama will continue to be vocal at the OAS because we believe that the organization must be kept in form. We think that eventually in the dynamics that are taking place, and we truly hope that the initiative by UNASUR um, delivers on the expectations. We are happy to hear that uh, the Holy See is um, getting involved. That brings, hopefully, uh, additional credibility to any sort of attempt of mediation or facilitation of a non-existent dialogue right now. No matter how much they are talking about dialogue, it is our um, opinion and perspective that there is no true dialogue just yet. There are too many things that had to be addressed uh, in order for any um, constructive dialogue to take place. Issues regarding um, human rights, violation of human rights, the lack of freedom of uh, speech and, uh, and uh, uh, expression, the situation with the political detainees, um, the, the sort of um, aggressive uh, vocabulary that is being employed, the lack of tolerance to disagreement, so it, it, all those elements have to be addressed, in our opinion, before the, the dialogue will take place. But we truly hope that this initiative takes place. And we truly hope that as the, it moves forward, uh, hopefully in the right direction, the OAS, we are confident and we, we, we are convinced that the OAS eventually will have to play a part. Because it's the hemispheric forum to address these sort of situations, because it's done it in the past and it should continue to do it in the future. Um, and finally, um, I just wanted also to um, refer to another aspect of the situation vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Panama, vis-a-vis -vis Venezuela, and is the suspension of commercial relations on the part of Venezuela. This is a, another unfortunate action on the part of Venezuela. We think that um, it was not carefully thought um, but there is one thing clear. Panama will use all its legal instruments, both locally and internationally, to um, protect the national interests. And in that sense, you will see Panama being vocal at the international fora, particularly at the WTO. Uh, we've already started addressing this situation, and you will continue to see that uh, in the coming days and weeks. The measures taken commercially, in our opinion, are inconsistent with Venezuela's obligations uh, under international trade agreements, and uh, they will have to be corrected. It might take time, but uh, you know Panama has, and with this I close, a history of knowing how to wait and be perseverant in obtaining uh, the objectives that we believe best served Panama's national interest. And the best example is the negotiations of the Panama Canal. So if we did it with the big one, <laughs> we can do it this time around as well. So as I said yesterday at the OAS, we are a friend to everyone. We will always be ready to stand and contribute in the situation of Venezuela to contribute uh, in other global topics, regional topics, but this is a small, great nation with a very firm government that will be acting on behalf of the Panamanian people to the very last day of this administration. Let's not have a single doubt about that. Thank you very much. I mean, I think you've, you've answered all the questions. So I think we should just...
leave. Um, no, this was very, very good and, and super comprehensive, and I appreciate that. Uh, and my two questions, the first question will go to that. Um, what do you owe this clarity to? I mean, you have clarity with regards to your uh, economy, your role in the, in, in, in the region, your role uh, in the hemisphere. You're very clear on uh, your relationships, not, not just with the United States, also the role that you want to play with the EU. Uh, how did you get to the success? There's so many countries in the region that are struggling uh, with this question, you know, who they are in the region and what should be the way forward for them, either politically or economically. But you've been able to articulate in your uh, remarks uh, with remarkable clarity uh, that you guys have figured this out. What do you owe that to? I think it's a mixture of uh, several things, but one that it just uh, comes to my mind immediately when, when, when your question was presented is the clarity and pragmatism of President Martinelli. Uh, you know, under the Constitution, President Martinelli, of course, leads the international relations with the advice of its foreign minister. Um, and he, is, he was very clear from day one mm -hmm. where Panama stood in 2009, the good things that um, we as an administration could, you know, um, based our initiatives upon, you know, state policies in a way. For example, international trade has been those uh, sort of policies that every single administration had identified as as critical for the country, regardless of the political party. So he was very clear on that. He's very knowledgeable on trade and, and, and how trade can be an economic and social tool for development. Um, he's been very pragmatic. He knew where he wanted to take the country. He knew, for example, from day one, he started telling the team um, and everyone, we need to continue be measuring ourselves against some sort of a standard. That's why the competitiveness index of the World Economic Forum has been one of the most valuable tools that we have used in this administration in order to measure how much we were accomplishing in different sectors uh, in this uh, you know, uh, path towards a more international, international country. Uh, with a president as pragmatic and as clear uh, in its objectives and goals as President Martinelli. I think the administration, regardless of how many, for example, foreign ministers have uh, been uh, you know, uh, appointed and you know, in internal politics, this is one of those uh, criticisms to President Martinelli. Uh, the fact of the matter is that we are transitional. Mm -hmm. you know, it, there is an institution, there is an objective, there is an agenda. He leads it uh, with, greater, with great clarity and the results by June 30th uh, are going to be there. Mm -hmm. I mean, would you attribute some of this as well? That I mean, for years and years, you've been relevant in, a, in, in global terms, and mostly because of trade. And now uh, you're sort of making the transition, or you're pivoting into doing this in a much more aggressive way. And um, uh, I mean, we always talk about the region uh, having a global relevance. Mm -hmm. And it seems that you've, uh, and, and maybe that is because of trade and because of the canal, uh, you, you've understood that very early. On that issue, how uh, is the construction of the expansion going? Uh, there were some troubles early on. How is that process right now? Where do you see that going forward? Well, um, we're very pleased that um, the situations, the, the, the differences that existed between um, the Panama Canal Authority and the contractors. Uh, the contractors uh, have been, of course, a, a result. Um, the process is moving forward uh, as, as usual. Panama is very clear on how much we need to expedite the conclusion of this uh, major project. And, and it's not only because it's a national interest, which it is, of course, but it's because of the responsibility of Panama to, to international trade. Uh, it, it never stops to impress me when you know, traveling internationally, uh, the, the importance to major uh, players around the world um, that assign to the, to the canal. Uh, you, you talk to the foreign minister of Japan, for example, and, and he shares with you the international energy strategy that they have for the years, the coming years, and the Panama Canal is there. You talk to Brazil, and the Panama Canal is there. Uh, you talk to uh, China, and the Panama Canal is right. there. So there is this responsibility 
um, of Panama to the international community and a responsibility for ourselves to conclude this. And we, we are we're moving forward. Uh, we, we are confident we will conclude it with uh, you know, some months of delay, of course, is natural uh, because of what happened, but with, uh, I guess, also a demonstration of how committed we are to the project. I think the negotiations and the differences and how the, the, the Panama Canal Authority handled uh, the situation um, proves yet one more time how strong the institution is, how independent it is, and uh, how serious we are uh, as a nation when it comes to international responsibilities. And uh, my last question uh, before I open it up to, uh, to the audience. Um, you talked about the OAS and you were very clear and emphatic about your commitment to the OAS, its importance in the region. Here in the United States, people complain a lot about the OAS, that it doesn't do enough, that it takes too long, that unanimity is, is always very difficult to achieve. Uh, there's no debate. Uh, the reference, uh, as an example, the case of Maria Corina coming and, and, and how that episode uh, devolved. Uh, fiscal problems and then the application of the Democratic Charter and the difficulties of applying it. You talked a little bit about your interest in correcting some of the problems with the OAS. Could you allow, elaborate a little bit on that? Sure, I think those, you know, those sort of criticisms uh, are legitimate. Yeah. Um, it shows that there are points of views about um, what is not working uh, at the OAS, um, you know, based on the opinion of, of some. The point is that if um, there is concern about those aspects of the organization, address them, engage in addressing those, those uh, um, aspects that um, are not fine uh, in the organization. Do not walk away from them. Why? Uh, uh, because this is the hemispheric uh, organization. It has a history. Uh, it was created out of a moment of unanimity in the Americas. Uh, so I guess that uh, it took a lot, and we cannot just let it go. Uh, particularly important, in our opinion, for uh, the United States. When you think of the dynamics, the geopolitics uh, in the continent, in the Americas, you can quickly realize that this is basically the hemispheric forum to engage the rest of the Americas uh, for the United States and, and for Canada, mainly. Uh, and if you see a, a Canadian government very much involved uh, in, in sorting out uh, the future, the present and the future of the organization. I just, yesterday I had the opportunity of uh, meeting with the Canadian ambassador to the OAS, and I, I have to recognize his efforts, uh, how much he's engaged in issues as boring for some as administrative topics, financial topics. Uh, but they are very critical to the situation of the organization and to the capabilities of the organization into the future. Uh, you see a government that truly recognizes the value of the OAS. Mm -hmm. If you see that in Canada, I would humbly rec uh, recommend uh, to the U.S. government to truly and forcefully engage in all aspects of the organization. Um, Perhaps with a with a new uh, with a new um, focus, with a new way of doing things. Of course, there is this whole um, you know uh, argument, uh, which I think is outdated, of the imperialism and you know these sort of things, um, which is not real. Uh, but of course, there is a new reality of the, a new United States, which is more you know aware of. Uh, sharing and engaging with the rest of the continent. And that's where we would say to the U.S., take that, um, I guess, re renewed attitude and put it to uh, work in changing and transforming the OAS for the benefit of the United States and, of course, for the benefit of everyone because everyone else is willing to do it. Okay. All right. I'm going to take some questions from the audience. The gentleman with his hand up, if we could get a microphone to him. Hi, 
My name is Miguel Schloss. I am from Sur Invest, an investment company in Chile. Uh, thank you for your statement. Very clear, very practical. Uh, thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I have one question in connection with a somewhat parenthetical comment you made at the beginning yep. about Panama wanting to become part of the developed countries, part one country. Uh, I'm interested in particularly that aspect about what is it that Panama is or is planning to do uh, to do that because it's only a handful of countries in the last 20 or 30 years that succeeded in moving from middle income countries to developed because it's a very steep curve. It means uh, getting into more value added activities, it means creating capabilities where there are none, it means innovation, it means all kinds of very difficult things that produce more value added which generate the additional income. What will be your secret ingredients in this? Because I would like to see what we can learn from that in Chile. Thank you. Well, uh, of course we know there is it's a very steep uh, path, you know, to reach to to that um, to that sort of level. Um, so, in a sense, I think that we 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 have uh, imposed on ourselves that goal to make sure that we, you know, we work towards it uh, and get as close as possible. Uh, when you look at the numbers, the macroeconomic numbers, particularly in these five years, you see that we have walked a long walk, uh, fortunately, towards that uh, objective. Uh, the macroeconomic numbers have improved in every, in every aspect, you know, from the, the pure and dry uh, macroeconomic uh, numbers on the structure you know, in the economy to social uh, numbers. Uh, so in that sense, we are moving forward, and secrets to the formula. One uh, is that uh, we are now proud to call ourselves the second most competitive uh, Latin American economy after Chile, <laughs> and we are going to surpass Chile. <laughs> that's that's our first. That's our, that's our first. That's our first objective. Uh, so for us, Chile is a reference. Uh, frankly, I mean. The, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a country that, of course, we, we keep on the eye. And uh, we, as I said, uh, for, for this administration, and we would hope that uh, incoming administrations continue to, to, uh, to um, uh, I guess, exercise in this, this manner, uh, we need to measure ourselves constantly. Uh, you know, where we uh, have to, uh, for example, in terms of um, education, we, we recognize that to be more competitive, to be able to to, be, to generate more wealth, uh, we need to educate our people. Sometimes people uh, and governments look at these sort of uh, public policies in an isolated manner. You know, we have to educate everyone because you know, we don't want illiteracy. Okay? But you have to understand why is it that you don't want it and what are you going to get out of that sort of investment. That's the kind of things that President Martinelli does constantly. He thinks, for example, he's invested uh, and he, he bet on investing millions of dollars in creating the first institute for technology and medicine, um, which is something that people say, you know, why, why are you investing $50 million in this building when you have still people, I mean, uh, kids that need, I don't know, uh, subsidies for improving their diet in schools? You need both things because you need for those kids that you are now subsidizing and helping to ensure they have proper nutrition to have a good institution you know, tomorrow so that they become engineers and not necessarily something else because we, we need more engineers, for example, in Panama in order to be more competitive. Um, so those are the, th the, the, the sort of things that this government in these five years have tried to a, a, a establish and change because this is being an administration of change. Uh, um, we have changed the way we did things all over. And we would hope that this change is, 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 you know, is to stay. Those are the kind of things, again, that we, we look in our formula that we think that is the formula that would take us closer and hopefully to reach that sort of level that uh, we mentioned. As long as we uh, stay focused and willing and wishing to reach that sort of level, we will continue to advance. Um, infrastructure is key. That's why we have invested so much. When you have the sort of geographic position that we have been blessed with, 
and you do not invest on that geographic position, you are not uh, being true to your future. Uh, if there is one thing that Panama is, is logistics and is, is, is trade, we have to invest in that because that's how we would be best able to uh, create wealth for, for our people. We should not be investing in things that other countries are going to be better off than we are. Let me take the gentleman over here with the... Hold on one second here, sir. Raul Herrera, Arnold and Porter. Thank you. You've covered the waterfront, as they say, and uh, I see you've been as tireless and, and relentless as foreign minister as you were as a young uh, vice minister of industry and commerce Thank you. a few years ago. Could you touch on briefly on the recent uh, trade agreement with Mexico and its implications to the alliance? And having touched on the Asociación, would Panama consider joining the Caribbean Development Bank uh, if invited as Colombia, Mexico, and Venezuela are current members? Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the question. Um, you know, that's uh, the, the, the closing of the negotiations and the signing of the negotiations, uh, of the agreement, I'm sorry, with Mexico is, uh, you know, one of those uh, final confirmations of how uh, much we have delivered uh, in this administration and how practical President Martinelli is when it comes to objectives. Uh, the negotiations with Mexico have uh, taken in total over 15 years. I remember, uh, you know, fresh out of law school in one of my first uh, public positions uh, as a young trade lawyer in the, pre uh, in the Foreign Trade Council of the Presidency mm -hmm. when we just joined uh, WTO in 96, 97, uh, trying to figure out how we would, you know, uh, receive the Mexicans. Uh, and, uh, you know, administrations went by, attempts went by, uh, and it took President Martinelli to really sit down and say, we need to accomplish this now. Uh, after we had accomplished uh, the um, agreement with Mexico and Peru, of course, the Chile uh, agreement is, 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 is older. Um, and he wanted, to, he wanted it to, to, to do it this way uh, because there was a logic to it. And uh, with Mexico, he um, made sure that uh, the team understood and the Mexicans understood that it had to be accomplished in months, not years. And we did it in seven months. Uh, and we started from scratch because, you know, what we had left out of previous administrations was outdated. The realities of trade between Panama and Mexico were uh, different, so we had to start from scratch. And I have to uh, uh, recognize the tremendous uh, work uh, done by the uh, trade team, the very small, very efficient trade team that we have in Panama. Uh, and definitely is going to put Panama now where it, it, it must be, which is at the center of these a great uh, project, which is the Pacific Alliance. We are the link between those parties. Uh, we, are, we, we must be the platform for the Pacific Alliance to um, develop itself internally as, a, as an area, and of course, to engage the rest of the world, and particularly Asia. For us, it's, it's critical uh, to belong to Pacific Alliance, uh, and President Martinelli saw it from day one. Uh, now that we have signed the agreement, we, we will make sure that it becomes into law um, before we leave, uh, June 30th. Uh, and, and that's thanks to the fact that in Panama, international trade is a state policy. There, had not, there, have, there have been no international trade agreement where there has not been unanimity in the votes in, in the assembly. Every single MP has voted in favor of trade agreements. Uh, as for uh, the Association of Caribbean States and joining the bank, I would defer your question to my good friend, the Minister of Economy and Finance, that would have to come up with the money. Uh, <laughs> as for now, we need to make sure that we work on uh, uh, coming to a political agreement uh, between all member states into how we want to transform the forum itself. Uh, for us, that's the most important thing right now, more than belonging to the Caribbean Development Bank. We have one last question here. Let me just wait for the mic. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, Sienna Gergenti with B'nai B'rith International. Um, I think it can't be stressed enough 
um, how important your leadership on um, in the international arena has been on a number of issues. We don't need to go through the laundry list again, but I hope that you might speak to one in particular, being Israel. Um, you, Panama was the only Latin American country to um, vote against the observer state resolution um, for the Palestinians in 2012, and you continue to show a very principled stance um, related to a number of anti-Israel resolutions that we see come up year after year, um, which we hope will continue as we do anticipate uh, another push of unilater unilateral measures by the Palestinians at the UN um, this spring and going forward as, as we see now, even in the Middle East with negotiations breaking down and coming to the end of this nine month push by um, Secretary Kerry and, and President Obama. So hoping that you can speak a little bit more to the future of your relationship with Israel and, and particularly if you have some insights and care to speculate regionally where you might see that going. Thank you very much for, for that uh, question because it gives me opportunity indeed to uh, refer to a, a, a very important bilateral relation for Panama, which is uh, our relation with Israel, a historic one with Israel. Um, let's see. Um, the reason why Panama has uh, stood so firmly um, in support of Israel, I think, is just um, the logic of, of, uh, of how we see the world and the international community. Uh, particularly when you look at history. Um, now, the consistency of our support uh, to Israel, and which will continue to, and just uh, a symbolic comment, one of the first official uh, visits of President Martinelli was to Israel, and one of his very last will be to Israel. Uh, the same in my case, uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out dates to uh, pay a visit to uh, Minister uh, Lieberman to discuss uh, many global issues as well. Um, what I was saying is that this consistency in our relation is also, uh, and, and you have to uh, think about this, uh, is also an opportunity for Panama to also be a constructive uh, friend to Israel in the sense of also telling uh, our friends in Israel when we think that this, the realities of the region and the realities of the world uh, need a different opinion. And why I say this is because when you think of how we voted uh, about the, state, the Palestinian statehood, you need to read very carefully how we explain that vote. And this is something we've, we explained to our friends uh, uh, Israel, and is that we believe that Palestine has a right to be state, and we believe they have a right to live in peace just the same as Israel has a right to. And there is a collective responsibility. It's not just the responsibility of Israel. It's not, it's not the only the responsibility of Palestine. And unilateral actions on the part of either one. Because we have to recognize that there are moments when Israel acts unilaterally. Uh, so does Palestine. It's not going to solve the situation. This is a collective responsibility in Palestine must um, be uh, convinced that it, mu it must assume it's part of the responsibility. And it goes towards the guaranteeing to Israel um, a peaceful li living in, you know, with, with Palestine and the neighbors. As long as that's not in place, at least on the part of Panama, we will not be able to recognize Palestine. There must be that before Panama recognizes Palestine. Uh, and, and of course, uh, you know, the situation in the region continues to be complicated. That's why we are you know, um, so worried about the situation in Syria. The same uh, we, we talk about, we, we refer to Iran. Panama has been vocal, been very vocal uh, at the UN in regards to Iran. Uh, and uh, we are worried. We would hope negotiations uh, with Iran would move forward in a positive way that would ensure, among other things, uh, peace and tranquility for Israel. What we are seeing um, coming from every angle is that it's not yet there. So uh, if uh, an ally like Israel and a friend to Panama like Israel is worried, we are worried. 
and let me take advantage of my role as host to ask you one last question. You've talked about your accomplishments and your aspirations in a very good, complete way. You're at the end of the administration now. What keeps you up at night? What do you worry about? Uh, we talked about your goals, the great things that you've done in your administration, but uh, what worries you? That's a good question. Uh, in, as foreign minister, I would say that uh, to ensure that as June 30th uh, arrives, and I said this several times, that uh, you know the foreign policy vessel that I've been in, uh, entrusted with by President Martinelli reaches a safe port. And by reaching safe port, I mean that we are very clear and, uh, and eloquent enough in um, presenting to the Panamanian people um, the accomplishments in international relations mm -hmm. of President Martinelli. Uh, you know, like in any democracy, if you Google, you will find a lot of debate uh, in regards to mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm sure the list of accomplishments is far larger. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that sense, uh, what uh, worries me at night is to make sure that by June uh, 30th, everybody understands that in the balance uh, of uh, net results, the positive is far, far larger than you know, any ne post potential negative, and that Panama has moved out of its comfort zone and it's uh, now ready and, and able to assume new responsibilities and challenges that will uh, also contribute in um, putting Panama closer to that first world objective that President Martinelli dreamt, dreamt for Panama um, when he assumed res the presidency in 2009. Okay. Well, I want to thank you thank for you. spending your time with us and being generous. We've gone over the allotted time, so I appreciate your being here. Appreciate all of you folks that are watching in the webcast. I uh, just want to tell you that um, you've done a great job. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure that we'll have you again in another capacity. It will be my pleasure. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.